That's all. Commissioner, the next witness is Mr Dante DeGori, the Chief Executive Officer of the Financial Planning Association of Australia. Mr DeGori, would you prefer to take an oath or would you wish to make an affirmation? An affirmation, please. Good. Perhaps you could stand up. Thank you. I solemnly and sincerely, I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm declare, declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give the evidence that I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Do sit down. Yes. I please the commission. Can you state your full name? Uh, Dante Giuseppe Degori. And your business address? Uh, 75 Castle Ray Street, uh, Sydney. Are you the Chief Executive Officer of Financial Planning Association of Australia Limited? I am. And have you received a summons to appear before the Commission to give evidence? I have. Do you have a copy with you in the witness box? I do. I tender that, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.218 will be the summons to Mr Degori. Mr Degori, have you made a witness statement dated the 20th of April 2018 for the purpose of this Royal Commission hearing? I have. And is that statement in answer to rubric 2-22? It is. Do you have a copy of that witness statement with you in the witness box? I do. Do you say the contents of that witness statement are true and correct? I do. I tender the witness statement of Mr Degori dated 20 April 2018, Commissioner. That statement will be Exhibit 2.219. I please the Commission. Thank you. Yes, Ms Orr. Uh, Mr Degori, you've been the CEO of the FPA since March 2016. That's correct. And before you were the CEO, you were the General Manager Policy and Conduct and the General Manager Policy and Government Relations That's of correct. the FPA. What did those roles involve? Those roles involved um, running the policy and government relations area of the association, developing submissions, advocacy work uh, on behalf of the FPA, uh, as well as overseeing the teams responsible for uh, managing the uh, professional standards uh, conduct um, uh, process of the FPA. Were you a financial advisor before you commenced with the FPA, Mr Degori? Uh, I've held an authorised rep status uh, and representative status uh, with organisations prior, yes. And which organisations were they? Uh, Clearview Retirement Solutions um, and uh, through um, Guardian um, at Astron uh, Limited. Did you hear the evidence of Ms McKenna and Mr Henderson, Mr Degori? I did. Uh, and I want to start by asking you some questions about the way the FPA handled Ms McKenna's complaint. Uh, did you know Mr Henderson before the FPA received Ms McKenna's complaint? Yes. Uh, how did you know him? Um, uh, my first encounter with Mr Henderson was actually an appearance on a TV network with Sky. Um, to appear on a show. He was a guest panel member with me. That would have been about 10 years ago. Um, and he's obviously a member of the FPA. And so I've also appeared on his show um, that he hosted on Sky Business. Um, and he also attended our Congress uh, in 2016 uh, and was a uh, MC um, at that Congress. He was an MC at your Congress and you've appeared on his television show over the last 10 years? Uh, not over the last 10 years. We first met I'm about sorry, 10 years ago. I'm sorry, 2010, you yeah. said. So over the last eight years, you said you first met him when you were both guest panel members on a television show? Yes, sorry, 10 years ago, before 2010, uh, before I worked at the FPA. It was the first time I'd met him. Um, since then, I have appeared on his show perhaps maybe half a dozen times. Uh, would it be fair to say that Mr Henderson is quite a prominent member of the FPA? I wouldn't say he's a prominent member. He's obviously a high-profile member in that he's known, but he's not a prominent member in the respect that he's engaged with the FPA on a regular basis. Uh, but he's been the MC at your Congress? Uh, yes, he has. And. Ms McKenna first contacted the FPA uh, with a complaint about Mr Henderson in March 2017? Correct. 
uh, and she made a written complaint to the FPA about Mr Henderson's conduct. Yes. So that was over a year ago. Yes. Uh, has that complaint been resolved? Not concluded, no. Has the FPA imposed any disciplinary consequences on Mr Henderson? Not at this stage. Why not? Because the matter's not concluded. Why has it taken so long for the complaint to resolve? Um, matters like this do take time, unfortunately. There are a number of elements to the process. Um, specifically, uh, since the turn of the year, uh, the matter um, has uh, stored to some extent, uh, specifically because of the following reasons. One, our investigation officer, Mr Mark Murphy, who was noted um, in the evidence uh, and was conducting the investigation, uh, has left the organisation uh, just before Christmas. <coughs> Um, and uh, we have obviously, in terms of resourcing, um, replaced Mr Murphy since then, um, but that itself has also stalled uh, the, the uh, procedure. Um, and there also has been the, uh, the hearing that took place in March in respect to the matter um, around uh, Mr Henderson um, hasn't concluded. So there's, since March, there's been ongoing discussion between the FPA and Mr Henderson in respect to the particulars of that, of that matter. Ongoing discussion as to the particulars of the matter, do you mean ongoing discussion as to a mutually agreeable resolution to the complaint? Uh, the extent that the matter needs to have both parties in agreement in order for it to be submitted to the Conduct Review Commissioner, yes, that's correct. The matter has been submitted to the Conduct Review Commissioner though, has it? It has, that's so correct. what is the ongoing discussion about then? The uh, Chair of the Conduct Review Commission was not, um, was not happy with the proposed agreement um, and has in, uh, effectively instructed the parties to uh, come to uh, a, a revised position based on uh, his amendments to that. Why do you say the matter has stalled because Mr Murphy left before Christmas? Mr Murphy had finalised his investigation report before he left and made his recommendations, hadn't he? Yes, he has. Uh, so what impact has Mr Murphy's departure had on...? Oh, the, the, the impact is in just in terms of resourcing and able to continue the matter without an investigation officer in that role. Uh, and that matter then has had to be taken up by the head of professionalism uh, in addition to obviously his other roles. Um, and it was just a matter of obviously replacing Mr Murphy, which we have now um, as of March. Why is it necessary, uh, Mr De Gori, for there to be some agreement or consensus uh, with your member about the resolution of their complaint? Uh, there isn't a need, however, the um, there is a, a, an availability through the disciplinary regulations for, um, through the investigation officer, through the FPA, uh, to uh, approach the member in respect to a summary disposal um, of the matter, mm -hmm. um, which allows for the opportunity, um, subject to agreement of both parties, to present that option to the Conduct Review Commission Chair mm -hmm. as a way of settling the matter without potentially having to go through the process of a full hearing. Um, so that option's available and that option was, was taken. That option was taken despite Mr Murphy recommending to the contrary? Mr Murphy had recommended that at, at that point in time when he conducted the report that it was unlikely uh, and that was a lot to do with the fact that Mr Henderson was uncooperative uh, with the process. Um, obviously subsequent to that, uh, Mr Henderson's response to the investigation report um, provided an opportunity potentially for uh, Mr Henderson to agree for the fact that there were sanctions, uh, sorry, agree that there were breaches um, and as a result of that the opportunity for the FPA to consider how we could better or improve, um, uh, correct Mr Henderson's uh, conduct um, was was seen as an opportunity to um, uh, sees an opportunity to um, use the summary disposal option within disciplinary regulations. So now that Mr Henderson has become cooperative, you're trying to reach an agreement with him, why not just impose some sanctions on Mr Henderson, Mr De Gori? Uh, according to the disciplinary regulations, that process, including the sanctions, is done through the summary disposal process, which includes confirmation and agreement to 
breaches as well as appropriate sanctions. Well, the summary disposal is one of the ways of dealing with your complaints. It's not the only way, is it? Uh, no, it's not. Um, sanctions when can be imposed. Sanctions can be imposed. Um, uh, that's an option uh, available uh, to us. Um, but that would be something that would be done through the Conduct Review Commission panel. Yes, so why has the Conduct Review Commission panel not imposed sanctions on Mr Henderson? Uh, it may still. Um, uh, at the moment, the agreed terms have not been... Well, the terms have not been agreed. Yes, and that's what I'm trying to understand. Yes. Why do you need agreed terms? Why can you not ask the panel to impose sanctions on Mr Henderson? Um, we... The option in terms of the summary disposal requires that there's at least the opportunity of agreed terms that can be presented to the Conduct Review Commission Chair. Uh, the Chair may disagree with those and then it would proceed to a panel where they would determine uh, the breaches and, and sanctions. Why are you so focused on summary disposal of this complaint? I'm not focused on summary disposal of this case. Why is the FPA case? so focused on summary disposal of this complaint? It's an avenue that was taken and we're exploring that option. We're not confined to having to do that only. It's just the option that we've explored uh, since February. And um, if it doesn't conclude to our satisfaction, then it will go through to a panel hearing. How much longer will you explore that option before going to a panel hearing, Mr DeGory? Um, I think it's very imminent that that decision would be made uh, in respect to those, in respect to what's in front of us at the moment. So we have revised terms from Mr Henderson and his party, um, and the decision about whether or not to accept them has not yet been made. Are you aware that those revised terms resile from acknowledgements of findings that had previously been proposed by Mr Henderson? Sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, are you aware that the proposed findings put forward by Mr Henderson now resile or retract acknowledgements that Mr Henderson was previously prepared to make about findings on the part of the FPA against him? Yes, I'm aware of that. And does that suggest to you that uh, those, the revised proposed terms will be or won't be accepted? Uh, if you're asking for my opinion of that, I mean, it's very hard to see how we could accept those, but that's, again, that process hasn't concluded. How long will it take you to decide whether to accept those? Well, the professional standards team will have to decide that and it will be imminent, mm -hmm. yes. All right. Could I um, ask you some questions about the way the handling of this complaint has unfolded? We've um, I've gone to the end of the process, but can I yes. take you back to earlier in the process now? Um, we know that Mr Murphy was assigned by the FPA uh, to investigate the complaint and we know that Mr Murphy gave details of the complaint to Mr Henderson early in the piece. Is that right? That's right. Uh, and we know that Mr Henderson provided a written response to the complaint? Yes. And he did that in May last year? Yes. Have you read the written response to the complaint that was provided by Mr Henderson? Uh, not in complete detail, no. All right. Um, could I ask you to look at that document, which is FPA 0006 0001 0047. This is a letter that um, I took Mr Henderson to in his evidence, Mr DeGory a letter dated the 12th of May from Mr Henderson uh, to Mr Murphy. Yes. You say you have read this letter? I've seen this letter, but I've not read it you've completely. Not read, you've not read this letter? No. Uh, did you hear what I said to Mr Henderson about the contents of this letter on Friday? Yes, I, yes, I did. Uh, you heard what I said to Mr Henderson about his description of Ms McKenna in this letter as being aggressive and nitpicking? Yes, yes I did. Is that how you would expect a member of the FPA to respond to a complaint by a client? Absolutely not. Uh, do you know if anyone within the FPA indicated to Mr Henderson following receipt of this letter that his response was inappropriate? Uh, no, I'm not aware. Not aware that anyone did? No, I'd imagine Mr Murphy would have, but I, I'm not aware of that. I can't confirm that. Uh, and having sent this letter to the FPA on the 12th of May last year, uh, Mr Henderson emailed you directly? Yes. 
Uh, can I ask that you be shown FPA 00017 0001013. That one's Exhibit 2.211, the earlier document you referred to as Exhibit 2.208. Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> and we see there the email from Mr Henderson to you on the 20th of June, Mr DeGory, which starts, Dante, your talk with Mark appears to have aggravated the situation rather than assist. Did you speak to... Uh, Mr Murphy about Ms McKenna's complaint uh, prior to receiving this email? Uh, I had, yes. And why did you do that? Um, Mr Henderson had contacted me um, uh, and uh, indicated that he was frustrated with the process. Um, and I had a conversation with Mr Murphy, um, which was around uh, just ensuring that if there are any um, processes or procedures that he needed to inform Sam of that he would do that to keep him uh, abreast of the process and timelines. What frustrations with the process did Mr Henderson express, Mr DeGory? Uh, he wasn't aware of what was happening and what the next steps were. And, and what wasn't he aware of? We've seen that um, he had provided a written <sighs> response to yes. Ms McKenna's complaint. Yes. Well, I mean, that's what he had said to me. Um, uh, the uh, in terms of what he, what he wasn't aware of or what he didn't know, he didn't express them in detail uh, to me. Uh, I informed him that I could not interfere with the matter and the only thing that I, uh, that I uh, can do is ensure that if we promise to deliver something to a member that uh, we ensure that we keep that promise. The FPA is very concerned to ensure that it keeps its promises to its members, isn't it, Mr DeGory? Uh, yes, we do. And I suggest to you that um, the FPA is more concerned with that than with administering a rigorous disciplinary system in relation to its members. I, I, I don't agree with that at all. I think the process does need to be rigorous and it does need to ensure procedural fairness for all parties. Um, and this is just a matter of ensuring that if uh, the member is informed about a process in the step and is promised something in terms of a, a, a deliverable, then that should be met. So I want to be very clear. Yes. What did you say to Mr Murphy in your talk with him, which is referred to in this email? Um, that he was to continue the investigation as he sees fit and that if there was anything in terms of timelines uh, and, and processes that, um, that could be explained to Mr Henderson, that. It, obviously that he does that. So as the CEO of the FPA, you had that discussion with the investigating officer of Ms McKenna's complaint? Uh, yes. Do you understand that that could be seen by others, Mr DeGory, as interfering with the investigation of that complaint? Um, it could be seen that way, yes. Did you consider that before you consulted with the investigating officer about Mr. Ms McKenna's complaint against Mr Henderson? Uh, yes, um, I was very careful that it was not about the particulars of the matter and as I, as I said, it was to ensure that Mr Murphy um, um, was to continue his investigation as he sees fit, um, but just in respect to ensuring that deliverables are met in terms of whatever they may be. Mr Henderson says to you in this email, my peers would be interested in the workings of this process and what it means to be a member of the FPA. What did you understand? Mr Henderson to be referring to there? Um, I'm not too sure what to, to have made of that. Um, it, um, it wasn't, I, I did not respond to this email um, uh, and I took that to be a response in itself. Um, I was not happy with obviously that um, the tone of that email and what Mr Henderson was potentially um, insinuating in that email. Well, what did you think he was insinuating by that sentence I've just read to you? Um, that he would, uh, that he would likely go and inform others of uh, his dissatisfaction with the FPA or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr Henderson goes on to say in this email to you, I just hoped everyone would get a fair go and dealing with the FPA has been more difficult than ASIC and FOS and you're a member organisation. Yes. So how did you react to that comment from Mr Henderson? 
Um, well, as I said, I didn't respond to Mr Henderson um, and if uh, if that's his opinion, that's his opinion. I mean, I, I take a lot of pride in the fact that we, we do have rigorous processes and it's not meant to be a uh, an easy process in terms of going through the disciplinary process. It is obviously confronting. There's a complaint against you uh, and members may feel um, uh, defensive as a result of that. Um, so if it is a difficult process, well, then that's actually a good thing. Did you convey any dissatisfaction to Mr Henderson as one of your members with the content of this email? No, as I said, I did not respond, which um, in itself sent the message uh, in, in that um, I felt um, that it wasn't it wasn't uh, appropriate to respond in any way. What message do you, did you think that you were sending by not responding to this email, Mr Degori? Um, that I wasn't acknowledging um, his, uh, his uh, accusations, if you like, about the way we're conducting the process. But you didn't say anything to that effect to Mr Henderson? No. Uh, could I ask you to look at um, FPA 0017 0001 0004? Now, this is an, uh, a set of emails on the 3rd of July 2017. Uh, the uh, last email that I took you to uh, was the 20th of June 2017. So we can see here uh, on the second page that on the 3rd of July 2017, um, uh, uh, Mr Henderson wrote again to you. Uh, Dante, another two weeks have passed since speaking with John Bacon and I've had no letter from Mark Murphy as promised, outlining the issues as they relate to the code and no offer of a further meeting date. This entire experience and complaints process continues to be stressful, painful, drawn out without further res and without resolution. Now, who is Mr Bacon, firstly, Mr uh, He's Head of Professionalism. He's uh, Mark Murphy's um, manager. So he's Mr Murphy's manager and the Head of Professionalism at the FPA? Yes. And Mr Henderson and Mr Bacon had been speaking? Um, yes. Well, what was the purpose of them speaking? Um, I believe it, um, it may be in relation to um, Mr Bacon explaining to Mr Henderson the process of the complaint. Well, is it usual for the subject of a complaint to speak with the FPA's head of professionalism while the investigation into the complaint is ongoing? Um, it may from time to time, yes. Why? Um, if there's uh, um, uh, a question of process um, that maybe need to be explained um, or uh, a question about the investigation officer himself, um, then uh, it is possible sometimes for the head of professionalism to at least offer an explanation as to what the process may be. Do you not see a danger, Mr Degori, uh, in the subject of a complaint communicating directly with the investigating officer and your head of professionalism while the investigation into that complaint is ongoing? Uh, but they are the ones investigating the complaint. And that's precisely yes. the problem, Mr Degori. Do you not see a problem? Do you not think that a member of the public looking at this from outside would be concerned about the subject of the complaint having these direct discussions with those who are investigating him? As I said, the, the investigation officer and the professionalism team are the ones investigating the complaint and must obviously speak with the with the member and the complainant as a result of the investigation. We're not talking about any formal discussions, <clears throat> any formal interview about the subject matter of the complaint. Instead, it seems that Mr Henderson is just calling the investigating officer and your head of professionalism. Uh, and he, he may be inquiring about the, about the next step in the process. Or, I'm not sure what the inquiry was about. Well, your response to this email that you received from mm. Mr Henderson on the 3rd of July about this was to apologise to him. Sorry, this is very disappointing. We'll follow this up immediately. Yes. What were you apologising to Mr <coughs> Henderson for, Mr Degori? Um, he had been allegedly he had promised to receive something uh, two weeks ago and had not received it. So as I mentioned earlier, in terms of at least 
ensuring that if there was a, uh, a promise for deliverable on uh, a service or, and this is, it goes across the whole organisation, um, then um, I think it's important that we keep to that promise. Were you aware that by this time on the 3rd of July, Mr Henderson had left the FPA? He was no longer a member? Uh, no, I was not aware at that point, no. Um, in your view, does a um, member who ceases their membership but is the subject of a complaint about something that happened while they were a member have a continuing obligation to participate in the FPA's disciplinary process? Uh, yes, they do. Um, and in this case, um, from what I know now, um, Mr Henderson, um, uh, I understand, did not renew his membership or pay his membership. Um, under the disciplinary regulations and the constitution, uh, a member um, is, remains a member while subject to um, a, a conduct matter investigation or a complaint, irrespective of whether he or she chooses to pay their membership. So for all intents and purposes, he is still a member. Well, he was not still a member, was he? No, he was. He still is a member today. I'm sorry, could you explain that? According so to he had ceased to renew his membership, he, you said? Yeah, he did not renew his membership, yes. did not pay, yes. but the constitution allows the FPA to continue to treat the individual as if he is a <laughs> member for the purposes of um, our disciplinary processes. Okay. All right, I tender that document, Commissioner. Emails between Henderson and Degore, 3 July 17, FPA 0017 0001 0004, Exhibit 2.220. Uh, so you have these email communications with Mr Henderson in July 2017, and it's not until October 2017 that Mr Murphy delivers his report into Ms McKenna's complaint. Oh, that's correct. Uh, why did it take um, so long for Mr Murphy to deliver that report? Uh, I'm not sure the complete details, but obviously the, the process does uh, require um, Mr Murphy to uh, complete his, his investigation and then produce the report. Would you agree that Mr Murphy's report was quite damning of Mr Henderson's conduct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you to look at that report, which is FPA 0019-0001-0537? And exhibit 2.212. Thank you. Could I ask that you be shown within that 0559? You've read this report, I assume. Yes, I have. Uh, Mr Degore. And we see at the bottom of 0559 that, among other things, Mr Murphy concluded that in all of the circumstances, there is a strong and reasonable inference that the member's conduct stemmed from a lack of objectivity or a conscious decision to place his own interests before those of the client when the client trusted otherwise. It is not apparent that the member would not have made the same recommendations if not for his conflicts. It is apparent that the member based all judgments on the complainant's relevant circumstances. And at 0561, we see Mr Murphy expressing his view about summary disposal. Uh, Mr Murphy concluded that as the matter currently stands, the FPA is of the view that it is unlikely the alleged breaches will be suitable for summary disposal. The FPA does not believe that any of the alleged breaches, if proven, would constitute a minor instance of unsatisfactory <coughs> conduct and be capable of being dealt with summarily. And Mr Murphy therefore made a recommendation pursuant to clause 57 of your disciplinary regulation that the FPA be directed to commence disciplinary proceedings under part seven by issuing a notice of disciplinary proceedings against Mr Henderson on the basis that he had a case to answer in respect to more than one allegation of breach. Uh, and he had referred to those breaches in the report. Yes. You see that, Mr Degore? Yes. So the references within um, Mr Murphy's recommendations to section 7.3 and 7.4 are references to the FPA's disciplinary regulation? That's correct. Can I ask that you be shown that disciplinary regulation, which is FPA 0001-001-0046. It's exhibit six to your statement. <coughs> uh, 
Now, this is the version of the disciplinary regulation that was in force at that time. Yes, that's correct. And it's also the version that's currently in force? That's correct. And it deals with disciplinary proceedings against members of the FPA? That's correct. And those disciplinary proceedings usually begin with the making of a complaint by a client? That, that's correct. Uh, but they can also begin with a complaint by the FPA itself? That's correct. Now, at 0055, <coughs> we see in clause 25 uh, that the FPA is required to investigate every complaint. That's correct. And one of the purposes of the investigation is to determine whether the conduct complained of is capable of constituting a breach. Yes. And we see from 0050 that a breach means a breach of the FPA's codes and policies or its constitutional regulations. That's correct. Uh, and at 0059, we see that a member of the FPA is required under clause 47, here we have it, uh, to provide reasonable assistance to the investigating officer in connection with a complaint or investigation? Yes. Do you think Mr Henderson complied with that duty, Mr Degori? Uh, no. Were there any consequences for him as a result of failing to comply with that duty? Um, they're, they're currently, um, obviously, disciplinary proceedings had commenced, so um, there will be an outcome of consequence. Well, that outcome will be referable to the complaint made by Ms McKenna, won't it? Yes. Um, what will happen in respect of Mr Henderson's failure to comply with this duty imposed on your members? Well, that would be part of the outcome. I see. Yes. And at 0060, the investigating officer's report is given to the chair of the Conduct Review Commission? Yes. What's the Conduct Review Commission, Mr Degori? Uh, effectively, it's our uh, private tribunal established to um, implement the disciplinary regulations. And how is it constituted? Um, through the, the FPA board, uh, through the constitution. So the, the constitution empowers the board to establish the regulations and um, the establishment of the Conduct Review Commission to oversee them. Uh, who sits on the Conduct Review Commission? Um, the Conduct Review Commission is made up of a chair and a deputy chair, and there's a selection of panel members, uh, 15 of which have been selected by the board, um, who are chosen from time to time to appear uh, when panels are required or when hearings uh, have been called. And we see from 0061, the following page, uh, in clause 53, that after reading the investigating officer's report, the chair can decide to summarily dismiss a complaint or decide to commence disciplinary proceedings. That's correct. And Mr Murphy's report recommended the latter course, that disciplinary proceedings be commenced? That's correct. And we see from 0064 that once disciplinary proceedings are commenced, one way that they can be dealt with is by summary disposal under section 7.3? That's correct. And that involves the member discussing the complaint with the investigating officer and agreeing to propose a particular course of action to the Conduct Review Commission for approval? That's correct. And at 0065, we see that another way that disciplinary proceedings can be dealt with is by a summary finding of a minor instance of unsatisfactory conduct under section 7.4. That's correct. And that can only happen if the FPA and the member apply to the Conduct Review Commission for the matter to be dealt with in that way. Uh, that's correct. And finally, at 0066, we see that a disciplinary proceeding can be dealt with by proceeding to a hearing before a disciplinary panel. Yes. And if that happens, the disciplinary panel will make findings? That's correct. And we see from 0071 that the disciplinary panel imposes sanctions? That's correct. So that's the course that has not been taken in relation to Mr Henderson? Um, it 
can still be taken. Mm -hmm. And to date has not been? Correct. So on the 17th of November last year, the Conduct Review Commission directed the FPA to commence disciplinary proceedings against Mr Henderson? That's correct. Uh, and if we turn to FPA 0020001282822, we see an email dated the 20th of December last year from Mr <coughs> Murphy to Ms McKenna. Copied to Mr Bacon, your head of professionalism. And in this email, Mr Murphy tells Ms McKenna that disciplinary proceedings arising from her complaint have been set down for hearing on the 8th of March. Yes. The reference is to the 8th of March 2017, but I understand it to be a reference to the 8th of March this year. Correct. Uh, now, um, was this the first time that the FPA told Ms McKenna about the outcome of the investigation into her complaint? Um, I'm not aware of uh, any other correspondence that Mr Murphy may have had with Ms McKenna, um, but I'm aware of this. Okay. Yes. And why did it take over a month after the decision to institute disciplinary proceedings to tell Ms McKenna? I, I'm not aware of the reason why. And in this email, Mr Murphy tells Ms McKenna that he won't be working at the FPA beyond the 21st of December yes. 2017. Uh, why did Mr Murphy leave the FPA? Um, he moved to another organisation. Yes. We saw earlier that Mr Murphy had expressed the view that the matter was not suitable for summary disposal under section 7.3 or 7.4. That's correct. But that was precisely what the FPA went on to attempt to do. Um, I, I believe that that was in response to Mr uh, Henderson's response to the investigation report. Um, uh, and that was the course of action that the professional standards team took. I tender that email, Commissioner. Email Murphy to McKenna, 20 December. Uh, 17 FPA 0020-0001-2822, Exhibit 2.221. Could I ask that you now look at FPA 0019-0001-0061, which is an email from Mr Bacon uh, to Claire Pater, Mr Henderson's lawyer, on the 21st of December last year towards the bottom of the page. Do you see that, Mr DeGory? At the bottom of the page? Yes. Yes. Uh, and Mr Bacon says, Hi Claire, further to our conference on Tuesday and directions conference yesterday, please find attached for your review on a without prejudice basis our draft proposed application to the Commission pursuant to section 7.3 of the FPA disciplinary regulation. Yes. And we've seen that that's the provision providing for summary disposal. Correct. So why was the FPA so keen in the face of Mr Murphy's recommendation to negotiate an outcome with Mr Henderson? Um, I think the option uh, that I understand the process took from here is there is a directions hearing with the Conduct Review Commission Chair yes. to consider appropriate next steps under the disciplinary proceedings. Yes. Um, and it was uh, put to the Conduct Review Commission Chair the option of a summary disposal, um, which he's obviously permitted for that process to, uh, to be undertaken um, and to allow for discussions to occur yes, as an option. My question to you was about why the FPA was so keen in the face of Mr Murphy's recommendation to the contrary to negotiate an outcome on this complaint. I wouldn't say it was where the FPA was keen. I think the FPA looks at all opportunities to see where we can uh, not only discipline the member, but how we can rectify the member's behaviour. Um, this is still within the bounds of disciplinary proceedings, uh, and it all, is all subject to uh, the agreement of the Conduct Review Commission Chair. Um, and if there's an opportunity to consider um, uh, an outcome that uh, not only sanctions the member, 
uh, in respect to the breaches of the code, but also considers significant um, sanctions around um, changes to the member's behaviour and conduct to address uh, or correct, um, then the FPA does want to consider ways in which we can um, change uh, conduct and behaviour as well, and a summary disposal is one of those options. Mm. A, a, an option that requires negotiation and agreement. Agreement to the agreement breaches. Agreement by the and, member. Uh, correct. Agreement to the breaches and agreement to the sanctions. Thank you. I tender this document, Commissioner. Uh, email Bacon to Plater, 22 December 17, FPA 0019 0061 is Exhibit 2.222. So the negotiations with Mr Henderson about summary disposal of the disciplinary proceeding continued into the new year? Uh, uh, correct, that's my understanding. And could I ask that you be shown FPA 0019 0010756? This is an email uh, on the 5th of February at page 0757. <coughs> From Mr Bacon to Ms McKenna. Yes. Updating her on her complaint. Yes. And so by this time it's approaching a year since Ms McKenna has made her complaint. Yes. And Mr Bacon tells Ms McKenna that the FPA is trying to reach an agreed outcome with Mr Henderson for summary disposal under section 7.3. I'm sorry, I can't see that. Where's... Oh, are you referring to the, the bottom email? I am. Yes, yes, I see that. And we see that um, Ms McKenna responded to this email at 0756 and 0757. If we could have both of those pages on the screen. And Ms McKenna noted that there'd been <coughs> considerable delay in dealing with her complaint. Do you see that down the bottom of the first page, Mr Degori? Just trying to find them, sorry. Second last line on the first page. Right, it's off the screen. Uh, down the bottom of the first page, first Mr. Degori. Yes. And do you see on the second page that um, Ms McKenna expresses concerns about the lack of information that's been provided to her and she requests copies of Mr Henderson's response to her complaint and Mr Murphy's investigation report? Yes. Did the FPA provide Ms McKenna with a copy of Mr Henderson's response to her complaint? I believe we have not. Why not? Um, I, again, that's the discretion, I'm not sure of what's occurred with Mr Murphy when he was investigation officer in terms of any of the information he may have provided to her or not provided, but it is the discretion of the investigation officer to determine um, what information is provided to the complainant. Um, obviously keeping them informed of the process uh, is important, but in terms of the information that is shared is at the discretion uh, and the reason for that is that once disciplinary proceedings have actually been enacted, the matter is actually um, a matter between the FPA and the member, uh, and, and the complainant uh, is potentially um, uh, obviously a witness to the proceedings. Um, and I know in some cases uh, the investigation officer may decide not to issue some of this information because the complainant may be used as a witness in a, in a potential hearing, which is still possible in this particular matter. Uh but Mr Henderson's response to Ms McKenna's complaint was provided to the FPA well before any disciplinary proceedings were enacted? Oh, that's correct. Um, but on the potential, uh, there's always possibility 
that the matter will go to a hearing. So once the investigation officer decides that he is not, he or she is not going to dismiss the matter, which obviously in this case we have not, um, uh, and therefore it's going to the Conduct Review Commission for disciplinary proceedings to commence. Uh, it, one of those options is very much a hearing. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, um, the investigation officer needs to use their discretion as to what information the, the complainant has in respect to their appearance, but will potential appearance at the hearing. What you're describing is all um, in relation to general practice, uh, uh, Mr. Degori. Yes. Did you see the email uh, that I showed Mr. Henderson on Friday, in which Mr. Henderson specifically requested that the FPA not provide Ms. McKenna with a copy of his response? I did see that. Yes. Is that why it was not provided to no, Ms. McKenna? Absolutely not. I no. See. Do you think it's important for a complainant to be kept up to date about the status of their complaint? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's required by the FPA's disciplinary regulation, isn't it? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And the disciplinary regulation also requires the complainant to keep confidential any matter that you provide in connection with the handling of the complaint. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So why couldn't you provide material to Ms McKenna on a confidential basis? Um, again, that's an option available to the investigation officer. Um, but as my understanding, as, as I mentioned, that if uh, the proceedings would go to a hearing, um, there are some um, inf information that is obviously our evidence for the purposes of uh, running the complaint against the member um, that um, may not be beneficial for the uh, complainant to be aware of for the purpose of them presenting as a witness to that hearing. Um, it, it, it's, um, it is absolutely at the discretion of the investigation officer as to how they see the matter proceeding. Ms McKenna in this email asked for an opportunity <clears throat> to be heard before the Conduct Review Commission, didn't she? Uh, I'm aware of that, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see Mr Bacon's response to that request within this email chain at 0756. Uh, there we have the email from Mr Bacon in response on the 7th of February and Mr Bacon told Ms McKenna uh, just under halfway through that email uh, that she did not have a right to be heard in the proceedings because she was not a party to the proceedings brought by the FPA against Mr Henderson. Yes. Is that generally the FPA's position, that a complainant has no right to be heard in relation to the disciplinary proceedings arising from their complaint? Uh, the, um, the complainant is heard. Um, the, uh, the complainant has been involved in the preparation of the complaint and the uh, matter that the FPA will run against the member. Um, on my understanding of this particular request by the complainant was to be heard orally at a hearing. Yes. Um, and that is uh, subject to the Conduct Review Commission panel as to whether or not they wish to hear from the witness or any witnesses. So that's a decision that has to be made uh, by the panel members themselves and the Conduct Review Commission chair. It's not a decision of the FPA. Um, so what Mr um, Bacon's uh, comments there are expressing are in context of the fact that she doesn't have an automatic, she's not automatically going to be appearing and giving oral evidence that will be subject to whether or not the, uh, the panel and the CRC chair uh, want to hear further evidence from her. Her written statement and, and evidence that she's produced are obviously produced as part of our matter against the member. So she is heard in that context. I believe this is in relation to being, being her being heard orally, yes. which is not necessarily uh, the right uh, going in terms of it occurring in all instances. Yes, and it's not the practice of the Conduct Review Commission to permit that to occur, is it? Um, my, under uh, my understanding is that witnesses have been called uh, during hearings. Uh, Sorry. Not talking about um, the process of giving evidence. I'm talking Sorry. about the process of making oral submissions at the hearing. Uh, is it the FPA's practice to permit a complainant to address the Conduct Review Commission? Uh, not to address, but to appear as a witness, but yes. 
and we see that Mr Bacon tells Ms McKenna in this email that it's not the CRC's practice in these matters to formally hear complainants on the question of summary dismissal. I'm sorry, summary disposal. Oh, that's correct. Why is that? Um, it just has not been my experience. Uh, the experience that that's occurred, I'm not sure why. That's a matter for the Conduct Review Commission. Do you think a complainant should have an entitlement uh, to be heard on whether or not their complaint is going to be summarily disposed of? Uh, I believe uh, that the complainant is informed of that approach and has asked for their input or feedback in respect to that, um, at least in writing. Um, so my understanding is that the Conduct Review Commission would um, potentially, uh, well, sorry, let me rephrase that. The Conduct Review Commission would ask about whether or not the complainant would be satisfied with that or if they have any concerns with that. Well, approach. that's not what Ms McKenna was told. Ms McKenna was told that it wasn't the CRC's practice to formally hear complainants on the question of summary disposal. Um, formally appear and give evidence, uh, yes, but in terms of uh, their feedback or input in, term, in terms of the fact that the matter is being summarily disposed, I believe, yes. So I believe Ms McKenna has been asked for her feedback on that. Yes, we see yes. a reference in this email to the FPA being interested in her views. Correct. Uh, I, I, I tender that email chain, Commissioner. Emails between Bacon and McKenna, 5, February, uh, 5 to 7 February 18, FPA 0019 0010756. Exhibit 2.223. And by a few days after this email, on the 12th of February this year, the FPA and Mr Henderson had agreed on proposed terms of summary disposal of the complaint. Uh, that's my understanding. I'm not sure the exact date, but yes. Yes, that was in February this right. year. Right, okay. And there was an agreement between the FPA and Mr Henderson on proposed <coughs> sanctions for Mr Henderson. I'd imagine that would be part of that process, yes. Uh, and before we, I show you a document about those agreed sanctions, I just want to ask you about the different types of sanctions that the FPA has the power to impose. Right. If we just go back to the disciplinary regulation at Exhibit 6 to your statement, FPA 0001 0001 0046, we see at 0088, <coughs> that the sanctions that are available are set out in Schedule B to the disciplinary regulation. Uh, the member can receive a reprimand. Yes. The member can receive an apology. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. The yes. complainant can receive an apology. I apologise. Um, the member can have their membership suspended. Yes. The member can be required to undertake remedial education. Yes. Uh, the member can be required to pay a fine of up to $20,000 per breach. Yes. The member can be required to provide an undertaking. Yes. The member can be expelled from the membership. <coughs> yes. Or the member can be required <coughs> to undertake a period of supervised practice. Yes. And there's then a reference to disciplining in some other way, having regard to the nature of the breach. Yes. So which of those possible sanctions do you regard as being the most serious? Um, uh, expulsion. And what kinds of breaches might warrant expulsion from membership? Um, uh, well, in particular, um, uh, any major harm uh, caused to a to a uh, consumer, a client, deliberate harm, um, fraud, um, systemic breaches uh, of the code. Um, so very serious cases of um, conduct that um, uh, that the member has, which would mean that the member should not be fit to practice. And since the 1st of January 2013, so over the last approximately five years, how many members have been expelled from membership as a result of disciplinary proceedings against them? Um, I believe there's been about six, according to my, this in my the statement. Sorry. You tell us in your statement that there were five. About five, sorry. Yeah. Uh, are you aware of any licensee that requires its uh, employees or authorised representatives to be members of the FPA? 
I'm, I'm only aware of one directly um, that I have knowledge of, uh, who's the chairman of the FPA, uh, who runs his own licence. Um, but otherwise, um, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I, I'm aware that there are licensees that, that may require membership um, of a professional body as a requirement of membership, uh, sorry, as a requirement of employment uh, with them. But whether it is the FPA directly, I'm not aware of any that exclusively of the FPA. So if a financial advisor is expelled from the FPA, the most serious sanction that yes. you can impose, uh, they can still practice as a financial advisor? Um, expulsion from the FPA does not remove their authorisation or licence, um, but it could lead to their removal of authorisation or, or employment, uh, depending on the conditions of their licensee or employer. Yes, but you've just said that you're not aware of any licensees other than the one run by your chair that requires its members to be, I'm sorry, requires its employees Mandate. or authorised representatives to be members of your association? Uh, that's correct. However, um, uh, we have uh, licensees who have signed a member of understanding with the FPA, uh, which part of that member of understanding is that you will not employ or authorise an individual who has been uh, disciplined or banned, uh, sorry, banned or expelled uh, by the FPA. So that relates to new engagements by licensees, does it, of people that you've already expelled? Uh, yes, it does. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Uh, but there's nothing that requires uh, a licensee to take any action in relation to an um, employee or authorised representative that you have expelled from membership? Uh, not directly, no. Mm -hmm. no. So do you accept my proposition to you that if a financial advisor is expelled from the FPA, they can still practice as a financial advisor. Oh, absolutely, yes, yes. And if a member fails to abide by the sanctions that the FPA imposes, what can the FPA do to enforce them? Um, if the member does not abide by the sanctions, then they can be expelled. So it's still... Absolutely. The only thing you can do is expel them from your membership? Yes. And when a member is subject to disciplinary proceedings by your association, are the findings and sanctions made public? Yes, they are. Uh, you say in your statement that the FPA is required by your constitution to keep confidential all complaints and disciplinary matters concerning its members unless the matter becomes subject to the publication provisions in part 13 of your disciplinary regulation. That's correct. Can I take you to part 13 back in uh, this same document uh, at 0073. Uh, so part 13 begins by saying that the FPA shall publish the outcome of complaints, investigations, disciplinary proceedings and reviews. Yes. Uh, and then at uh, cl uh, sorry, uh, clause 130, down the bottom of that page and over to the following page, clause 130 deals with publication following a disciplinary panel determination. Yes. And it requires the name of the member to be published? That's correct. Uh, is there any requirement for the name of the member to be published where the matter is summarily disposed of? under section 7.3? There isn't a requirement, but it's an option available to the CRC chair um, to uh, have the member's name published, yes. So no requirement, but it's an available option? Correct. And what about where the matter is disposed of under section 7.4? Um, I, I would need to check that, but I don't believe uh, it's, it would be published. I don't believe it could be published. So that's yes. where there's a summary finding of a minor instance of unsatisfactory conduct. Correct. That's not published? Uh, not the name of the member, no. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, now, could I take you to a document which is RCD um, 
uh, now this is the document that's published on the FPA's website showing the outcome of complaints, investigations and disciplinary proceedings. Yes, that's correct. And on the first page we see that since 2009 there have been, on my count, 18 determinations <coughs> by the Conduct Review Commission. That's correct. And in seven of those cases, the identity of the advisor has been kept confidential. That's correct. And on the second page, 0002. Uh, sorry, can I just clarify why? Is yes. you allowing me to do that? Yes. Um, uh, that um, is a result of the way the disciplinary regulations were at the time. So we've had a number of versions of the disciplinary regulations up until um, 2011. Um, the Disciplinary regulations did not permit the Conduct Review Commission Chair and the FPA to publish the names. That's now been reversed, so it is automatic that uh, a finding made by the CRC panel hearing um, is automatically published. So there's no discretion around that. So when do you say that position changed, Mr uh, DeGory? I believe it was as a result of the disciplinary regulations issued in 2011. Yet we see in this document that there are still um, advisors whose names are being kept confidential in 2012 and 2014. Uh, that's correct. I, um, I am aware on one occasion the, um, the uh, CRC chair um, uh, made I'm a decision not to I'm sorry, I, I, sorry. I didn't realise that we had the following page on the screen when I asked you that oh, right. question, which will have made it difficult to answer. I apologise, Mr Degore. If we could go back to 0001, mm -hmm. I was asking about the 18 yes. sorry. determinations and sanctions, and I was pointing out to you that we can see from that table that in 2012 and 2014, yes. the advisers uh, are still kept confidential. Uh, yes, uh, I'm not. I, I'm not aware of why those other ones have been um, have have not been published. Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't know the answer. To the reason for that. So it can't be the case that since 2011 you've automatically published the identity of advisers that are the subject of your CRC determinations and sanctions. Well, obviously, not according to that table. But it was my understanding that disciplinary regulations have been changed so that. Um, they are to be published as a result of um, uh, um, as a result of a disciplinary matter being concluded. All right. So you're unable to explain these references in this document. Uh, no. Um, and is one of them is someone who was expelled. Is that right? Sorry. The two four fifth down uh, CRC 2013. Point one, effective date uh, 4 January 14, somebody was expelled. That's correct. And the name is blinded. Uh, yes, that's correct. So you can see at the bottom of this page, Mr DeGory, that um, <coughs> this document shows it was updated in February 2018. So as at February 2018, the FRC, uh, the FPA, I'm sorry, had not identified the advisor that was expelled in 2014 uh, that the Commissioner has just re referred to. In 2014? Or the... Uh, oh, yes, that's correct. That's correct. Um, now can we turn to the second page, 0002, <coughs> where there's a table um, uh, reflecting that eight advisers have been the subject of summary disposal yes. since 2010 yes. uh, and sanctions were imposed in each of those cases including fines yes and in all of those cases the identity of the advisor has been kept confidential by the FPA that's correct yet the the page on your website on which these um, matters are published is headed professional accountability. Do you see that, Mr. DeGory? Yes, I do. And how is it possible to hold members accountable for their misconduct if their identity is kept confidential when they are found to have breached the FPA's codes and policies? Uh, the 
the uh, professional accountability looks at um, a number of measures to try and ensure that conduct can be corrected as well as obviously um, uh, sanctioned accordingly. Um, and the FPA, uh, for, for um, points that you've already mentioned in terms of uh, our ability to stop people practising, um, we don't have that right to take away someone's licence, but we do have the opportunity to educate uh, and to change uh, and influence conduct and behaviour. Um, obviously, one of those things we can do is, is, is to expel a member, uh, and that person then is no longer um, with the FPA and is able to then uh, go and continue practising um, without any education and or um, <coughs> professional standards to adhere to at all. Um, so one of the measures, obviously, with, a, uh, with this type of approach is to engage the member to improve and change their conduct in order to enable them to actually uh, adhere to professional standards and provide high quality advice rather than not. And part of that engagement or motivation uh, is uh, that um, their names are not published as a result of that. Um, and that's been the approach taken uh, with the FPA. You talked about your opportunity to educate, you have an opportunity to protect the public as well, don't you, Mr. Absolutely, Dibori? absolutely. And isn't the ultimate purpose of your disciplinary process to protect members of the public who seek financial advice? Yes, absolutely. And can a disciplinary process really achieve that purpose if the FPA keeps the results of so many disciplinary matters <coughs> that involve findings of breaches by your members yes. confidential from the public? Um, we can in, in the respect that um, those are confidential on the basis that the member does change their behaviour and address those um, issues and concerns, either through education or through supervision or wherever it may be. Um, so, and if they don't, then the threat of publication and expulsion is still there. But isn't a member of the public entitled to know that they have already breached your policies, codes and procedures? You might have views about what they're going to do in the future, but isn't a member of the public entitled to see who these people are that you have imposed sanctions on for those breaches? Um, again, the disciplinary regulations um, enable a number of options in terms of trying to address poor conduct and misbehaviour, um, and the FPA is uh, here trying to uh, measure in terms of the appropriate, um, uh, through the Conduct Review Commission, the appropriate process forward in managing uh, that conduct and behaviour. Um, and where that individual is a threat to the public, then yes, absolutely. Um, they should be not only banned, expelled, but named. But again, we can't stop that individual continuing to practise so that we have not changed that individual's behaviour. This publication is there, um, but uh, it doesn't mean that the, uh, the, the licensee or it doesn't mean that the uh, member of public is uh, necessarily looking at this publication to determine whether or not they will um, seek advice from the individual. What use is this page to a member of the public, Mr Degori? Well, it's available and it's there of, it is a public knowledge and we would hope that they would use that. But what does it tell them? Um, well, obviously, those members that are banned, it's, it's given the names of those members. What does it tell them about all the other members that you've taken action against on the first table on this page? Um, well, they can... Uh, well, it doesn't tell them about the individual member, obviously, okay. no. But it does uh, provide information about the, uh, the matters that, that took place. Um, and as I said, these individuals here um, can still be expelled uh, if they don't actually address uh, their conduct. And you expel people for the most serious forms of misconduct? Uh, yes. And you do that to protect the public? Uh, and the, Yes, we do, yes. Uh, and yet we saw on the previous page that the public can't see who you expelled in 2014. Uh, no. Attended that document, Commissioner. FPA Professional Accountability Actions and Outcomes at February 2018, RCD 9999001900001 is Exhibit 2.224. Can I come back, Mr Degori, to Mr Henderson and uh, the document containing the proposed terms for summary disposal of the disciplinary proceeding against him, which is FPA 0005 0001 0001.
If there are difficulties locating that document, which is an email, could we try FPA 0005 0001 0002, which is the document attached to the email? Or forming part of Exhibit 2.214. That's right. Uh, we now have the email and could I ask that uh, Mr Degore be shown the following page, 0002, which is the first page of the annexure. And then I'd like to take you to uh, two pages within that annexure, uh, Mr Degore, which are 0010 and 0011, if they could both be brought up. We see the proposed terms for summary disposal of Mr Henderson's disciplinary proceeding. So these are terms that we uh, could see from the email which came up on the screen before were put forward by Mr Bacon, your Head of Professionalism, uh, to the Chair of the Conduct Review Commission. Yes. Uh, and the agreed sanctions put forward to the Conduct Review Commission we see starting on 0010, the first was that Mr Henderson be admonished for breaches of your code of practice. Yes. Uh, the second was that um, Mr Henderson undertake that within seven days he'd pay all outstanding fees, subscription and levies due to the FPA for the 2017 and 2018 membership year. Yes. What sort of sanction is that? Uh, Mr. Degori, um, it's in relation to his membership fees. Is it appropriate for Ms. McKenna's complaint to be dealt with by a sanction which requires him to pay you uh, his outstanding membership fees? It, uh, for the, in terms of the member, that's a, a, an obligation of the member according to the constitution. So I imagine that's a direct result of that obligation nothing to do with Ms McKenna's complaint, is it, Mr Degore? No, not directly, no. no. But the, the matters, this matter is a matter between the FPA bringing the matter against uh, Mr Henderson um, and, uh, and therefore the FPA does uh, or can look at conduct or issues outside of the original complaint as well. I see. Uh, so Mr Henderson was to undertake to pay his outstanding membership dues he un was to undertake uh, to continue to do all acts and things necessary to continue to meet the eligibility criteria and general obligations for membership? That's correct. He was to warrant that he's taken corrective action to train his staff? That's correct. And the training was in relation to the particular superannuation products and adverse consequences of rolling out deferred benefits under superannuation schemes? That's correct. He was to undertake that he would review and modify his current practices and process uh, to ensure that he complies with various FPA rules? That's correct. Uh, and then he was in clause five to undertake to appoint an independent expert satisfactory to the FPA uh, to conduct certain reviews. That's correct. And finally, he was to undertake that he would report to the FPA in the following periods from the date of summary dismissal. Within three months, the finding of any review or gap analysis from the independent expert, an action plan and a timetable to implement the action plan, and within nine months, a confirmation of the implementation of the action plan. That's correct. And then we see under the heading other matters that the parties, this being the FPA and Mr Henderson, agreed that in consideration of Mr Henderson complying with those undertakings and warranties, the FPA agreed to be restrained from publication of Mr Henderson's name in connection with the disciplinary proceedings and the outcome of the matter, including the agreed sanctions. Oh, that's correct, provided that he does comply with those sanctions. So the FPA offered to keep Mr Henderson's name confidential? Uh, I'm not aware as to how that particular uh, component got into, um, into the final terms, 
Uh, it could be quite possible that Mr Henderson requested that. I, I'm not aware of how that... Well, whether the FPA offered it or um, Mr Henderson required it, the FPA agreed that's that correct. it would keep Mr Henderson's name confidential. Subject to complying with those sanctions, that's correct. Yes. And is that, is that the only mechanism that you have to ensure that your members comply with their sanctions, that you can reveal their identity? It's our strongest. It is our strongest, yes. Uh, thank you. Can I turn then to um, RCD 99990018001? And this is a letter that your head of professionalism, Mr. Bacon, wrote to the Royal Commission on the 18th of April this year. Yes. Uh, and at page three of that letter, triple zero three, we see at the bottom that the FPA reconfirms that the subsequent disciplinary proceedings against Mr Henderson resulting from Ms McKenna's complaint have not yet been determined or summarily disposed of. It is an ongoing matter and again the FPA asks that the matter be treated confidentially as any publication by the Royal Commission identifying Mr Henderson would render the CRC process worthless to Mr Henderson and cause significant damage to the reputation of Mr Henderson, undermine the process of the CRC and damage the FPA's relationship with other members. Yes. What, what did Mr Bacon mean when he said that publication by the Royal Commission would render the CRC process worthless to Mr Henderson? Um, I believe that that would be in relation to the fact that in order for, um, in order for the disciplinary process to uh, have a conclusion um, uh, and any participation of Mr Henderson um, in that process would obviously not, would not be forthcoming as a result of any publication of his name. The purpose of the CRC process isn't to create value for Mr Henderson, is no, it? No, it's not, no. And what was the FPA concerned that Mr Henderson might do if he was identified in connection with this CRC process? Uh, not do anything, uh, not comply with any of the sanctions uh, or proceed, um, uh, uh, proceed with, the, um, with the process at all. What do you think Mr Bacon meant when he said that identifying Mr Henderson would damage the FPA's relationship with its other members? Um, I am not exactly sure, except that he may be referring to the fact that um, members, um, members do expect that until the matter is concluded um, uh, that uh, their uh, details uh, and the matter of the complaint are remained confidential until its conclusion. Well, they expect that it remain confidential after its conclusion, don't they, Mr de Gorey? They may wish that, but that's obviously not always going to be the case. But we've seen it often is the case. It can be the case, yes. Um, is the FPA concerned that members might leave the FPA and go to another professional association if they find out that their name might be published in connection with a, su a summary dismissal? No. Um, why should members who've been the subject of adverse findings by your organisation have an entitlement to confidentiality? Um, they shouldn't. There isn't an entitlement to confidentiality. But it is our biggest leverage in terms of actually uh, impacting on change and conduct to change or change to conduct. It's your only leverage, isn't it, Mr. Degore? It is our main leverage. Yes. Yes. I tend to that document, Commissioner. Letter Bacon to solicitors assisting the Commission, 18 April 18, RCD 9999018001, Exhibit 2.225. So in March this year, those agreed summary disposal findings and sanctions that I took you to were submitted to the Conduct Review Commission? Yes. And the Conduct Review Commission <clears throat> refused to accept them? Correct. Uh, and when do you expect Ms McKenna's complaint to be resolved? I, I can't give you a deadline, but it's imminent. It's got to be imminent in, in the sense that uh, if the decision about whether the FPA um, will accept 
the, um, the current revised terms um, and also we need to determine whether or not the CRC will accept those. Could I ask that you be shown FPA 0019-0001-0145? Thank you. This is a transcript, Mr Degori, of a directions conference before the Chair of the Conduct Review Commission on the 6th of March this year. Yes. Uh, and can I direct your attention to 0155? Uh, and at the bottom of the page there, we see that the Chair of the Conduct Review Commission at this uh, directions conference said, I understand from the complainant's statement that she was attracted to approach you as a result in part of the media profile that you have developed. In my view, it is not consistent with the outcomes of this proceeding, having regard to the sanctions, for you to engage in public media appearances during the 12-month period contemplated in item six of the sanctions. Now, if you accept what I'm saying, you, as an additional sanction, will need to provide a letter to the FPA that you undertake to suspend or take leave from giving any public media appearances over the next 12 <coughs> months. Uh, did Mr Henderson, to your knowledge, provide such a letter? Uh, no. I tender this document, Commissioner. Transcript CRC Directions Conference 6 March 18, FPA 0019-0001-0145, Exhibit 2.226. Could I turn, uh, Mr Degori, to some more general questions about the FPA? Um, you've set out in your statement the number of members of the FPA since 1 January 2013. Yes. And since that time, you say that about 40% of the financial advisers in Australia have been members of the FPA? That's correct. And the number of your members has increased from just under 8,000 members to just over 11,000 me members? Uh, yes. And, and so just to clarify, they are, they are the practitioner members or voting members of the association? Yes. yes. What are the reasons that you think financial advisers choose to become members of professional associations like the FPA? Um, there are a number of reasons. Uh, in particular with the FPA, we also have um, the certifi Certified Financial Planner um, designation that many members uh, aspire to. Um, we also obviously set standards. We have a code of ethics. Um, we have education standards. Um, and I think as a mark of professionalism, many individuals uh, want to be uh, part of a professional body uh, to demonstrate um, uh, that they are part of a profession. Do you see financial advisors as being part of a profession or part of an emerging profession? Yes, absolutely, I do. Which of those? Oh, sorry, as an emerging profession. An emerging absolutely. profession. Yeah. And what do you think defines a profession? Well, individual accountability and responsibility um, around that. Uh, and individuals... Uh, um, um, uh, want and uh, to exercise their uh, professional judgment, uh, to be held accountable to high entry standards, uh, to maintain their education uh, on, a, on a very high standard basis and to obviously be held accountable uh, to those standards. Accountable to who, Mr Degori? Well, uh, well firstly, they, um, um, they've got to be accountable to themselves and they've got to be accountable to their, to their clients, but accountable to the profession. And how are they accountable to the profession? Well, in meeting those standards, and if not meeting those standards, then to be uh, disciplined accordingly. Mm -hmm. Are they accountable to the public? Yes, they are, yes. Uh, and do you accept from the documents I've shown you that your processes do not make financial advisers against whom you make adverse findings accountable to the public? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I think they're... Uh, uh, 
it's obviously not a perfect system, um, but the one of the uh, obligations of the FPA, in, in, in my view, is that we need to, as I said, it's an emerging profession, we have to play a role in educating members about their obligations as well. Um, individual financial planners uh, have to have a sense of well, have to be individually accountable for their actions and they have to understand what those obligations actually are. And I think that's part of the journey that we're on, that uh, many financial planners actually aren't acutely aware of what their obligations are. They don't actually really understand the law, let alone the, um, the, the code of ethics as an example. Um, and so part of our role is to educate train and to show them that as well, as well as holding them accountable to that. Is it consistent with holding them accountable to enter into negotiations with them that result in confidential resolutions of complaints made against them? Um, it can be in respect to the fact that they do change their conduct and improve their advice uh, and learn from the outcome. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't want to speak about uh, this particular matter directly, but I think um, it's important that we uh, work with those financial planners that are actually want to um, progress, want to actually evolve, want to actually do the right thing. I think it's our role to try and help them with that, to show them how to do that and to hold them accountable to that. Um, uh, but obviously, if that's not a willing participation by the individual, then yes, they should be um, banned and expelled and not practice. Your disciplinary processes are reliant on cooperation from the member, are they not? Uh, they can in parts, yes. Yes, and yes. but for the threat of identifying um, the member publicly, you rely entirely on your members to agree to the outcomes that you come up with. To, en to engage in the outcomes, yes, yes, in the process. Um, do you think that the public places their trust in financial advisors in the same way that they place their trust in other professionals like doctors or lawyers? Uh, generally speaking, uh, not, not in the same way, no. Why not in the same way? Um, well, I think there's a couple of things. One is the, the um, just history and time. I mean, uh, those other professions have been around for centuries, um, whereas financial planning is a very much a young uh, 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 emerging profession. Um, so there's obviously a lot of that. There's still an unfamiliarity as to what financial planning is and how it actually can help and benefit. Um, and, uh, and so that's an, an evolving uh, transition. Does the FBA actively seek to grow its membership? Um, I think as a membership organisation, we have to um, always consider the membership and looking at getting uh, members uh, who fit the right profile to be members of the association, uh, only to the extent of the number of planners in the, in the, in the country, yes. So do you actively seek to grow your membership? Um, what do you mean by that exactly? Do you try and get more people to join up to become members of the FPA? Um, through the website, through, yeah, uh, yes we do. Yes, yes you do. Yes, yes. Uh, and membership fees mm. are the chief source of the FPA's revenue? Uh, yes, they are. Uh, yes. Could I ask that you be shown FPA 000112112. This is the FPA's budget for 2017 to 18. Yes. Uh, and we see from that first page, and we'll need to blow uh, it up a bit to see the figures next to membership revenues, but we see that um, you make about $8 million a year through your membership fees. Uh, yes, so that's the budget, that's the expected revenue, yes. That's what you expect to make from um, membership fees. Yes. And if we turn to triple one five, we see that you expect to spend about one million of that on professional standards. That's correct. Uh, and you expect to spend about one million of that on the CEO? Uh, no, uh, that is not. The CEO, that's the department of the CEO, yes. which includes um, that it includes a number of things in there, including other staff of my department, yes. as well as um, 
uh, yes. So that's so you and your staff? And my staff, yes. How many staff are there? Um, there's uh, one staff in that as well, sorry, as also includes there the bonus pool available for staff. The what pool? The bonus pool that's available for staff. How does the bonus pool work for staff? Um, well, there's a pool of money that gets set aside um, that is then um, used to discretionally provide to um, uh, staff based on their performance. Uh, what are the criteria for receiving a bonus? Uh, each staff has key performance indicators in terms of their own roles um, that they need to adhere to. And do, they, do any of those key performance indicators relate to bringing in new members? Uh, for some staff it does, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. So we see that the office of the CEO, the budget is about a million dollars of your eight million dollars and professional standards are also about a million dollars of your eight million dollars. Um, what does the professional standards budget include? Uh, includes the members of the professional standards team um, and, uh, uh, and obviously the support function of the Conduct Review Commission. How many members are there of that team? Um, there are currently three members in that team, with a fourth member, um, a fourth member is included in that budget. I, want to Sorry, I didn't hear that. A fourth, a member. fourth member is included in that budget, yes. Uh, I want to put to you, uh, Mr de Gorey, that investigating complaints and conducting disciplinary proceedings isn't one of the primary objects or purposes of the FPA. It, it is. Uh, it is one of the objects of the FPA. Do you say it's one of your primary objects and purposes? Um, it, it's equal uh, in terms of the objects of the FPA. Equal um, with what? Well, equal with education, training, um, and providing services and resources to members. What about your marketing and communication budget, yep. uh, Mr de Gorey? Um, much more than your professional standards budget, nearly yes. $1.7 million. What's that yes. directed to? Um, so much of that is directed to our consumer advocacy. Um, so we run a consumer website called Money and Life that is uh, part of one of our objects in the Constitution is to promote the profession to the public. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, the profession of financial planning isn't as well understood by the Australian public as other professions. Uh, and we seek to obviously, one of our core roles and one of the reasons why individuals join the FPA, of course, is that we promote um, the profession and educate the public about what financial planning can do. And so much of that is, is expensed to uh, awareness with consumers. So how is that role of promoting um, the financial advice industry or emerging profession consistent with your role as um, uh, a, a disciplinary body in relation to the conduct of that profession? Well, I, I think our role is dual purpose. It's, we are not just a disciplinary body. Uh, we have disciplinary procedures against our members, but as a professional body, we also have to promote um, and uh, educate the, so we have to educate the profession, we have to promote the profession as well as discipline the profession. Mm. They are equally important. But it doesn't assist with promoting the profession to at the same time be imposing disciplinary sanctions on the profession, does it? Um, I, sorry, I don't understand what you mean. Well, the, the two things are difficult to reconcile is what I'm putting to you, Mr de Gorey, that on the one hand you're wanting to promote financial advisers, yes. And I'm putting to you that it's difficult to do that at the same time as imposing disciplinary sanctions on financial advisers for misconduct. I, I don't believe so. You don't see any inconsistency or oh, inconsistency, difficulty sorry. in achieving both of those objectives? Well, it, it's a challenge, obviously, we, but we, are, we, need to do, we do need to do both as a professional body. Well, since the 1st of January 2013, your disciplinary panel has made only six determinations. Is that right? No, that's correct. You set out in your statement the main ways that professional conduct issues come to the attention of the FPA, and the primary method seems to be self-declarations um, by applicants for membership and at membership renewal. Is that right? Um, that is that is one of the ways. Um, media, uh, um, the, the professional standards team keeps a watch of 
uh, the alerts from the regulators uh, in respect to that. But yes, self-reporting is a big component of the professional body, yes. And there's also complaints, I assume? Uh, of course, yes. Does ASIC ever refer matters to the FPA? Um, I'm not 100% aware of any formal referrals, but we do have informal uh, engagements with, the, with, with ASIC. Do they ever refer matters to you for consideration of disciplinary consequences? I, I'm, I'm not aware, no. They I'm don't? Aware no. I'm sorry, when you say you're not aware, I'm not that, aware of that any, ever happened to I'm not aware of, I'm not aware, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of it happening, no. Thank you. Um, and does the FPA take any steps to seek information from ASIC about its members? Um, not directly, no. Why not? Um, I, we have, uh, we have uh, regular meetings with ASIC and we do talk about matters uh, uh, in general, but um, and, uh, and on an informal basis, there may be discussions about individuals, but we don't have a formal process of uh, requesting information about every member of the organisation. So why not, is my I, question to you, Mr DeGory. Wouldn't I, I, you want to know, know if the regulator is investigating or imposing sanctions on your members? Oh, absolutely, and in fact, uh, in, in some cases where we know uh, or been aware that there are proceedings or reports issued by the regulator, we have asked if they could share information um, on those individuals, if they're members of the FPA. Uh, we understand, obviously, ASIC are subject to their own confidentiality and privacy issues, but we have asked for that on occasions when there have been reports issued by ASIC, yes, whether so or not those individuals. So you wait yes. till there's a public announcement by ASIC and then you follow up with some requests for information yeah, at that many, point? That's correct. Then many times that's when we're first aware that there is um, that investigation has occurred, yes. Uh, do licensees ever refer matters <coughs> to the FPA or notify the FPA when they've taken action against one of your members? Um, it is very rare mm -hmm. for that to occur, but it, it has happened, uh, I believe, on, on an occasion, but it's very rare. Over the course of these hearings, we've heard evidence about a number of advisers whose employment or authorised representative status was terminated um, by, the licensee, um, by the licensee for misconduct or who resigned after allegations of misconduct were made against them. And they included Mr Andrew Smith, Mr John Doyle, Mr Chris Harris, Mr Bradley Main and Mr Adam Palmer. Are all of those people members of the FPA? Uh, I'm not, I don't believe they are all members. They may have all been members. So some may be still members and some may so have So they've all been members at one point, is that right? Uh, I'm not 100% sure on all of them, uh, but most of those names you read out, yes. Uh, did the licensees of any of those people report their concerns about them to the FPA? No. Does it concern you that the FPA has members whose employment has ended in those circumstances and the FPA does not know about it? Yes, it does. Do you think that the public think that the FPA um, is the appropriate body to make a complaint to if they have a problem with a financial advisor? Um, the, 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 the consumer is uh, informed about the complaint processes and in most cases that process has a number of steps and the FPA is one of the avenues but in many cases um, it's not the first avenue that um, consumers will take because of the internal dispute resolution process that needs to go through first and then of course in most matters for complaints consumers are looking for compensation as a result of loss and that's primarily targeted to the financial ombudsman service um, and then in some, in some of those cases uh, individuals of the public will come to the FPA uh, to seek to determine whether or not the member the individual is a member and if so lodge a complaint. But that's not generally what occurs? Or in terms of the number of complaints that go to FOS versus the FPA absolutely not yes. Okay. yes. All right there's one more document I want to take you to uh, Mr DeGory but before I do that I tender the budget commissioner. The FPA budget 27 2018 FPA 0012 0001 exhibit 2.227. The last document is FPA 0002 This is the FPA's professional ongoing fees code, Mr. DeGory. 
Yes. Could you explain how this code works? Uh, yes, so this, uh, this is effectively a, sub, a standard within the complete FPA Professional Standards Code. Um, it is a code that has been approved by the regulator ASIC um, in respect to, as it says there, in respect to the Corporations Act uh, as an option available uh, to financial planners um, in, as an alternative to the opt-in provisions. Um, and it is only enacted on members for those who register to comply with that code, the ongoing fees code. So it's purely in relation to the ongoing service relationship that an individual has with uh, the advisor. Um, and the terms and conditions of this code replace that of the legal requirement under opt-in. So it relates to ongoing fees arrangements, ongoing fees for ongoing service. Th that's correct. Uh, and do I understand correctly that the effect of this code is that it means that a member of the FPA who registers for this code, yes. which any member can do, That's correct. does not have to comply with the requirement in the Corporations Act, in section 962K of the Corporations Act, yes. to give a client who is in an ongoing fee arrangement an opt-in renewal notice at the end of each two-year period. It, it replaces that obligation, that's correct. And it replaces it um, with a... Um, ability to have a conversation with a client to clarify whether it remains suitable to provide ongoing services once every three years? Uh, that's part of it. Um, the ongoing fees code actually um, uh, is more broader than the opt-in requirements. Yes. Um, it does also need to require that the ongoing relationship entered into is actually appropriate in the first place. Yes, as I well, see. and then that needs to be uh, constantly reviewed. That the yes. uh, ongoing arrangement is actually appropriate, and in in, it continues to remain appropriate. And having received that level of satisfaction, do we yes. see from two five two one? that the renewal interval in clause mm. 7.2 for the ongoing fee arrangement uh, then becomes every three years, no less High often less than, than every three years. That's correct. And in terms of what needs to be done in replacement of the um, uh, opt-in notice that the Corporations Act requires a client to receive, yes. we see in clause 8.1 that the participating member is required to clarify with the client whether it remains suitable to provide ongoing services under the arrangement. Yes, that's correct. Um, so this replaces a system under the Corporations Act, which means that having received an opt-in notice every two years, if a client does not return that opt-in notice, uh, then the ongoing fees arrangement terminates. Yes. So that is not the situation for people who register for this code? Um, it doesn't operate exactly the same way, but uh, if they, um, obviously the, under this scenario, uh, the, the outcomes are the same in that the arrangement would have to terminate if they don't get the arrangement renewed with the, with the, uh, with the client. But also on an annual basis, um, the members will have to submit to the FPA evidence that the ongoing fee arrangement is still appropriate yes. uh, and we can then determine whether or not it's not appropriate and to cease the arrangement. But to be clear, it. the advisors don't have to serve an opt-in notice? That's correct. Yes, that's correct. Um, they just need to have a conversation every three years about whether the ongoing um, fees arrangement uh, remains suitable. With the client, yes. yes, and they also still have to abide by the fee disclosure statement obligations annually. And is this a selling point for your membership? Um, it hasn't been, no. Uh, how many of your members register for the code? We have 18. 18 have yes. registered for the code? That's correct. I tender this document, Commissioner. FPA Professional Ongoing Fees Code, FPA 0002.001215, Exhibit 2.228. No further questions for Mr. Degore, One Commissioner. One matter that I might take up, Mr. Degore, you mentioned uh, uh, FOS uh, and awards by FOS. Uh, is it a requirement of your organisation that members uh, comply with uh, awards made by FOS? 
Um, it is a requirement that they're members of FOS, um, and it would be a professional requirement that they comply with those orders, but there isn't a, a, there isn't a direct requirement, if you like, that I could turn to any of our um, documents to say that. Would it be misconduct on the part of a member uh, not to comply uh, with an award made by FOS? In my opinion, yes. Have you had any uh, proceeding or complaint uh, which has raised an issue of that kind? Uh, no, we haven't, Commissioner. Um, but I, just to pro provide some context with that, um, most of those individuals or most of those non-compliance of the FOS determinations are licensees, are license holders. Um, in our case, it's the individual practitioner, so um, that is the member. So uh, th that may be the reason why uh, we haven't received a complaint. Yes. Is there anything arising out of that, Ms Orr? Before I turn to the uh, two parties who are represented at the bar table, is there any other party who seeks leave to cross-examine this witness? No. Uh, Mr Woods, do you have any questions? Mr Meehan? No questions, Commissioner. Yes, thank you uh, very much uh, uh, for your uh, evidence, uh, Mr De Gorey, uh, you may step down. You're excused you, further Commissioner. attendance. Commissioner, the next witness is Mr Philip Kewen, the Chief Executive Office, Officer of the As Association of Financial Advisers, but perhaps we could have a um, brief break to reset the bar table. Yes, uh, I'll come back at uh, 25 to midday. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs>